where were you born and maybe if you can paint a little picture of of the town or the city in which you you grew up in let's start from there well i'm uh, from a small town in transylvania in the northwestern corner of romania at the border with hungary and ukraine and uh, i was born in a very loving family which actually helped me to build everything that I built in life. If I, if I mention the word childhood, I instantaneously remember the vacations, the summer vacations at my grandparents, because my grandparents on the maternal side mm -hmm. uh, used to live in a very, very, very tiny village in the heart of Transylvania, not far away from Satu Mare. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were, it was actually in a valley surrounded by seven hills and each hill would have a name and a legend. And I remember my summer vacations as, as I think the most magic part of my childhood because exactly because that remote village would keep the traditions intact and the, 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 the authentic, authenticity not only of the nature and the beauty of nature but also the authenticity of the village life you know i was an urban girl and i was exposed to, to to the roots of my civilization because when i used to go to my grandma the women would still uh for instance wash um uh, the, uh, the, the clothes yeah. at the river you know with some special tools that they had so there, there was no dish uh, i mean there was yeah, no um, dishwasher or wash, any, wash yeah. yes nothing nothing like that so what was a typical it, traditional dish like you mentioned the traditions and what food what what did the food what, what what did you eat when you were with your grandparents oh my god i even remember even now the pies and also the, um, there is a so how could i tell you it's like um ragu made out of chicken but the chicken came from the backyard so it everything was so organic oh. you cannot find something like this now no so the cheese was in exactly from my grandmother's uh, uh, sheep uh, um, you know the milk was from my grandmother's cow wow. we would we would eat so healthily gosh i'm i i Miss so much those times also from this point of view. And we were a great bunch of, um, of cousins, all of us, five of us, because uh, uh, my mother's sisters had also children and they were all girls. Yeah. All of us were very talented musically. And also uh, we would organize theater performances on, um, in, my in my grandmother's backyard and the price for of the ticket consisted in eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So, uh, in order to have you know all those pies and all those uh, goodies, you know, we contributed to my grandma's uh, um, uh, refrigerator. How, how many eggs got you a ticket? Well, actually, as as many as you would like to oh, offer, okay. but usually minimum one, minimum yeah. one. <laughs> okay, the so one was almost frowned upon. If you, if you gave two, anyway, we, would, you know. we would stage uh, fairy tales, you know, and uh, those were also the excuses to, to be able to put on us the best dresses of my, our mothers, you know, because otherwise we couldn't touch them. So we had all sorts of excuse, excuses to, you know, get access to things that were not accessible normally. And I remember that we were pretty, pretty, pretty successful. We were very famous in that little village. And one of our favorite things was also, was also going up the hills. Because, you know, in, in those times, in the 60s, 70s in Romania, in, the, in that remote village, there was no radio, there was no television. So the announcements were made from the top of the hill. So, for instance, if the priest had something to announce to the village, he would go on the top of the hill because the acoustic was absolutely incredible. And he would announce, you know, the service or something important, some, someone's baptism or something from the top of the hill. So the top of the hill was very important for the community. So for us, it was a great honor to be able to go on the top of the hill and sing. 
from there. Where did the inspiration come from? Or was this just, I mean, from the very beginning, you just loved performing and your cousins as well? And, yes. And that was that? What, had there been musical, like in the family, was there anyone that was in the arts? No. You know, my parents were the first intellectuals in their family. All, all their ancestors were, were peasants, simple people, but this doesn't mean that they weren't very, very talented. So, for instance, my mother's grandma mm -hmm. used to, to speak in rhymes. She was so amazingly talented, so gifted, that she could speak all the time, you know, like, like she was reciting po her own poems. Wow. She was incredible. My, my grandfather was the greatest storyteller that I ever encountered in my life. And I encountered a lot of Sorry. gifted people. <laughs> right. He was so, such an amazing storyteller that once I brought him to my university at a seminar on storytelling. And he charmed absolutely everyone. And we were in a, one of the most prestigious universities in Romania. So it was just about natural talent, natural gifts. Everything was authentic and coming just from the heart. No, we weren't, uh, you know, coming from a noble family who had a chance of getting education, you know, in arts. It was just pure, pure talent. My dream was to be an actress and singer. And actually, I won absolutely all the competitions for reciting pop music, folk music. I was in, a, the, in, the, in the university, I was called Miss Voice because I had the best program on student radio. I uh, was in the theater uh, group of the university, in the satirical group of the university, in the rock band of the university. It, it, was, it was crazy. So, but my, before, before the university, my dream was to be an actress and singer. I had won all the possible national awards. So it was not only, you know, the, the normal dream of a child to be an actress. I really had results and passion. Mm -hmm. But m at that time in the communist Romania, there was only one drama school in the country. And there were seven slots per country, right? Seven slots per year. Unfortunately, the main criteria for getting into that university, one of the main criteria was uh, social origin. If you belonged to the working class, that was a clear advantage. Well, I belonged to you know, a family of modest intellectuals, uh, but still intellectuals, not working class. So my parents were so panicked that I will be exposed to a failure that they tried to convince me not to go to the drama school hmm. and because I told them very clearly that this is the only thing I want to do they plotted against my dream <laughs> and I found out 15 years after no and they wow, plotted in the wow, sense that they spoke to my mentor, who was uh, the main actor in our uh, local theater, to convince me that I don't have any chance and that I'm not talented enough. And he did that. And I gave up. Very easily, I think. Too easily. Uh, I forgave my parents because I know that they did absolutely everything out of love for me. They just wanted to protect me. They wanted too badly to protect me. It was the pure uh, fear of a parent not to see his child disappointed. Of course, there were lots of fears, you know, uh, at the time uh, related to the society I was living in, but they were the ones exposed to those fears, not me. I was protected. I was in a, in a bubble, in a beautiful bubble full of love. You know, and um, as I said, that gave me the strength and the balance mm. that made me resist at all sorts of, of, of challenges. I'm very curious when Romania's revolution, right, when communism fell in 89, what were you up to? And can you share a little bit about what was, you know, what was happening? It's very hard to tell you in a few words because this encompasses uh, tens of years of, uh, of, of, uh, of history, very sad history actually. 
But the, the catastrophe uh, started to shape up in the 70s when Ceausescu made uh, uh, an official visit to China and then an official visit to North Korea. And he got very inspired by the North Korean model of dictatorship. So he started to build a sort of North Korea in the southeastern part of Europe, in our country. He followed absolutely every characteristic of the North Korean dictatorship. Cult of personality, deprivation of the population by absolutely all the elementary needs that were long, in the, especially in the last 10 years, uh, so um, in the late 80s actually. It was the worst because there was no freedom whatsoever. Everybody was uh, monitored by the, this, by, the, the by, by the political police. There was no freedom. There was no food. There was no power. There was no uh, uh, heat. There was there was nothing. There was no hope. Wow. So at a certain point in 1989, uh, on the 21st of December, when he made the huge mistake to together. Uh, you know, a, a mass to, 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 to generate a mass meeting in order to um, commemorate some, some, some anniversary, um, something magic happened or something premeditated happened. We never know. We don't know yet because there are a lot of question marks. Was there some foreign influence that, uh, you know, stimulated the spark did the spark come from the Romanians or did the spark come from the intelligence from other countries, right? But what I can tell you is that I saw that on TV because I was a young mother at the time. I had just given birth to my second child. So I was in, at home in a maternity leave. My, my daughter was exactly two months uh, old on the 22nd of December. Um, and I watched everything live on television also because my husband, who used to be a director of photography at the time mm -hmm. with the National Studio for Documentaries, was the one who was filming Ceausescu. Wow. So, uh, because the, the National st the Documentary Studio was uh, uh, documenting everything that Ceausescu did. Promotion, propaganda. It was a sort of propaganda. I will tell you something about this uh, later on, if I remember. <laughs> there are so many things I'll, that I want I'll to I'll remind you. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So, in, during that mass meeting, the population started to, 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 to protest against Ceausescu. Ceausescu didn't understand what happened at, at that moment. He was just surprised and then surprise, um, the surprise became fear and then panic and then he just left. He left by a, with a, a helicopter, he, a helicopter uh, to a safe base, military base, but he was caught on the way. He met his wife and then he was quickly trialed and then killed on Christmas Day. What was your feeling? I mean, that happened. You, are, you just had your second daughter, uh, your maternity leave, your husband. By the way, so your husband was, I mean, capturing, I'm sure, a lot of this uh, just by obviously uh, it, it interestingly enough being there to record and uh, what was happening without knowing what was going to happen and so what what uh how was that how was that experience i remember only the fear to tell you the truth i don't remember any joy in that in those moments because to tell you the truth, my husband, I didn't see my husband two weeks. He stayed with his colleagues on the streets of Bucharest, filming, documenting absolutely everything for that studio. Unfortunately, all his work and his colleagues' work was monopolized by a guy who took the roles and sold everything abroad and he became very rich. Wow. So my husband doesn't have the, you know, the, the, the work for which he risked his life. They were filming from, you know, under the tanks and in incredible conditions. They were sleeping in a secret place in, in, the, in the basement of the studio. So I didn't see him two weeks, okay? Wow. I was alone with two children, my son and my daughter, and my mom, two women, 
surrounded by, by shootings. We, barric we made a barricade, we put all, all the furniture you know, on, the, on the door because we thought that the terrorists will come because there were, uh, you know, the, the media was full of, 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 of fake news regarding terrorists. Um, the water is poisoned. And I was breastfeeding, you know, and I didn't have anything in the house uh, because the shops were closed, obviously. So no food, no water. Uh, and when you hear that the water is poisoned, you, can, you know, it, it's the responsibility of the mother who doesn't know what to do for her children. And then during the night, it was particularly terrorizing because there, were, there was shooting all the time. I was so naive. I was sleeping with my body between the, the window and my children, thinking, you know, with naivete that if the bullets are coming, they will stop in my body and, you know, they won't get to my children. So it was such a confusing and, and horrible time. I didn't have the, 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 the time to, to, to feel that we gained our liberty and, you know, to, to, to enjoy it. I couldn't go on the streets. I had the responsibility of my kids. So I'm not a hero. Did, I'm not a hero. Did people, did people know that what the collapse meant or were there a lot of uncertainty? And okay, so he's fallen and now who's, you know, what's going to happen? Who's going to take his place? Or Like in every revolution, you know, there is ecstasy the, that prevails. People think, oh, now that we got rid of the dictator, now oh, the gates of heaven will open and we'll be rich and no, with no worries. And then after ecstasy, agony comes because you don't know what to do with your newly gained freedom. It's like coming from a black hole and you come in the sun and you're suddenly, you, you, you're blinded by, the, by too much light. You don't know which way to go. That's exactly the feeling that we had, you know. Of course, there were a lot of people in the streets, but there, was, there were also uh, apparently people loyal to Ceausescu who would kill. There were 1,000 victims who, who killed, were killed, uh, uh, shot at during those days until the 25th of December when Ceausescu was executed. After that, there were no killings anymore. And, you know, I happened to work over the years for the president mm -hmm. who was actually leading the country at the, at the time. And I asked him, you know, it was for the Romanians, it was striking that that execution took place on Christmas Day. We are a very religious people. Mm. You don't kill. First of all, Romanians don't kill. Romanians are one of the most peaceful nations and that you can know. Romania never attacked anyone during history. And suddenly we execute someone on Christmas Day. And he told me. It has hmm? to be. I mean, intentionally. I mean, that day was chosen. And what? What did he say? It, it was not chosen for its significance. It was chosen because they, uh, they uh, were aware of the fact that once Ceausescu is dead, there is a huge possibility to stop the killings. And this is what happened. So the president told me, that's why we took that sudden decision. We didn't, it didn't take you know, uh, enough time, let's say, for the trial. Because some, some people criticized the leaders at the time because they said maybe he would have deserved a long trial in order to, you know, to uh, understand how responsible he was for the catastrophe that he generated in the country. But he said, we didn't have the choice because we had to stop the killing somehow. And this was our chance. And this is precisely what happened. After Ceausescu died, there were no more terrorists. So by this, by this time you'd mentioned, you were already working with, was he already the president or he, he was a leader and set to become the president? No, no, no. I worked for the president in 2000. No, much, much, uh, much later. Much later. Yes. But he, was a, he was a leader. He was one, at, at this stage, he was one of the leaders, obviously, against... No. Oh, he wasn't. He was the leader. Oh. He was the one who assumed responsibility of, you know, taking the driving wheel in, in, a, in a complete chaos. And, of course, he actually paid the price because his image was very controversial. Mm. I think that still, now, these days, he doesn't have the image he deserves. I hope that history will put 
him in the place he really deserves. But there is so much hatred and so much toxic memories that have to clear up, you know, and to, to disappear until we will manage to judge everything in an objective manner. Where was the transition uh, towards the government uh, handling, the branding, the public really? What moment was there, was there a critical moment where there was a shift? Uh, before 1989, women weren't allowed to be diplomats in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Romania. So as a woman, I hadn't had access to diplomacy before the revolution. After the revolution, there were contests for admission in the ministry. And uh, one year after the revolution, and when my child was, uh, was uh, um, old enough, I uh, um, was admitted by contest in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and from there, everything started. There was a Minister of Foreign Affairs who is still the most, I think, the, one of the most remarkable Ministers of Foreign Affairs that we had, who recruited a lot of, young com a, a lot of newcomers in the ministry, and he immediately sent them abroad to study diplomacy. And I was one of the lucky ones. Wow. And that meant a lot to me because also, even if I was a student in French and English, I wasn't allowed to study abroad when I was a student. You know, we weren't allowed to travel or study abroad during the, the communist dictatorship. So uh, for me, uh, studying, uh, going to, a, attending a diplomatic training in Great Britain was for me something that oh, I had for many years. Who was, uh, who was uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs? What was his name? Uh, his name was Adrian Nastase. Uh, when uh, between 2000 and 2004 I was foreign policy advisor to the president, the president Iliescu, he used to be the prime minister at a time. Oh. So uh, he used to be a very, very sophisticated uh, intellectual and I think he was one of the greatest ministers of foreign was, affairs. Was he... I also had the chance to serve him in his office as, a, as an advisor after the diplomatic training, so he gave me a lot of chances. Was he, was he a mentor? Was he someone that, that you, uh, you kind of felt that along the way he was always kind of there and you felt comfortable reaching out or? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Well, after that, his, uh, his uh, life got a little bit complicated because of the political battles and uh, there were some juridical consequences. But I will never forget uh, the chances that he gave me and uh, what I learned from him especially. I learned a lot, especially when I worked in his office, I worked a lot about diplomacy, about, you know, being constantly uh, curious from the intellectual point of view. I think that intellectual curiosity is absolutely essential in the, in the personal development of absolutely anyone. So I learned a lot from him from this point of view. You have a certain way of, of defining what success means to you. Uh, to me personally, success means uh, a job well done because my only ambition in life was not targeting a specific position or a specific, um, I don't know, profession. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I was taught when I was a child was the fact that my only, my top priority at least, if not my only priority should be to get the job done and to get the job done impeccably and i personally think that this is the key to my success uh, i'm a very tenacious cancer i never give up until i get the job done and when the job is done that's my success that's my personal perception i think that each of us has his own perception and understanding of success for me this is it this is the essence it's true that in order to get the job done, I made a lot of sacrifices. And what I want all the youngsters, you know, who might listen to us or all those who listen to me whenever I had a speaking engagement, I would always tell them, there is no great victory without great sacrifices. Sacrifice is a part of success. Easy success is not a real success, you know. Um, for instance, you know, I had in my team 
absolutely brilliant young diplomats in New York. And sometimes, unfortunately, because of some political intrusion uh, uh, in, in particular intrusions in my ministry, um, there would be some people parachuted in the ministry with absolutely no diplomatic experience getting into, you know, important positions, not at the top, because that's kind of normal, but, you know, directors, suddenly directors without being career diplomats. And, of course, this would be frustrating for a career diplomat, that someone, you know, can uh, uh, go up the stairs while he is, you know, uh, someone jumps while he is going, you know, stair by stair, which is another key to success, not burning any stage, just climbing step by step, not two or three steps at once, right? Mm. And I would tell them, look, they might get that position, they might get even that diplomatic rank that you have been uh, passing through contests for, but they will never be able to experience the joy of something you accomplish with hard work. That they cannot have that. That's unique. That's only reserved for those who really work and accomplish something, you know? What? Because there is a special joy of, of the achievement. The word sacrifice and, and success is really unique in that in my perspective, in, in my case, right, because everyone has their own experiences, um, building a company and you go through so many different phases where you're trying out so many different things. And uh, m with my second company that I had, I remember working so hard that at some point I, you know, I literally burned out. Like my, my back gave away one day. And, and it was a very big message like, okay, the lack of sleep, uh, the more hours, that doesn't really mean that you're going to get closer to accomplishing a certain mission, right? That you, you have to figure out what's the most productive method that works for you, right? And then also what, you know, what are the things that you care about most? Because time is so precious, and that's why I'm super grateful that, <laughs> that you're here with me. But time is so precious, and you're constantly, as, you, as, as you're growing up, you're constantly figuring out where to allocate time, what's important to you. And, and like you mentioned, everything is a trade-off. Um, you know, for, for one thing, there's, a, there's usually a trade-off for something because you can't just bring back time, right? Um, you're so young and so wise already. No, uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, the, that's exactly so, because you went through, through through different experiences. That's precisely why. Was there a clear one that comes to mind that you say, "Yep, like to get here, I had to spend less time doing this," or to get here, it was you know, is there is there one in particular that comes to mind in terms of sacrifice when you were when you use the word sacrifice? Okay. Of course, I, I didn't have the chance to live all those moments that mothers live with their children. Mm. I didn't have the chance to, 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 to live as much as I would have wanted during 31 years of marriage with my hubby. Don't mm. forget that we were apart. I mean, I was in New York, he was in Bucharest. We saw each other like four times a year. Wow. There are a lot of sacri personal sacrifices involved, of course. Some diplomats are maybe luckier because husbands can come with them, uh, children are with them. But in our case, it's mm -hmm. all, you know, we long for each other. We have been longing for each other for many, many years. So this is the, the, the biggest and greatest personal sacrifice that I made for this. But I knew on the other hand that they know that this is important to me also because in this way, I could be their role model. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, I would inspire them. Uh, um, and they, they told me that, that I, they, I inspired them, but unfortunately I found out many, many years later that actually this, my performance and my husband's, my, my success and my husband's success put a lot of pressure on my kids without us putting right. pressure. But for them, it was, it was actually a pressure. And actually, they chose to work in other countries just to escape from the name, the pressure. from our family name. Because otherwise, everything that they, they would accomplish would be attributed to the fact that they 
are part of our family. So we, this is also another price that we pay for our success. My children, and I'm very proud of them, chose to, 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 to be challenged in the toughest cities of the world. In London, my son, and in New York, my daughter. So you can imagine that for a mom, this is very difficult. And look, look at our family. We are, I am in Belgrade, my husband is in the US, <laughs> my son in London, and my daughter in New York. And my mother is exactly on the opposite corner of Romania from Bucharest. Not even my mom and my, uh, my husband are together. So right. we pay the price every day. But we know what uh, quality time means because we really cherish When you're moments. together, you're together. Yes. And when does that, do you usually, uh, when you get together, is it usually in the same place or is it somewhere different? Out of all these Home. different destinations, which one do you usually pick? We are not a fancy family. We don't have many means. So home for us is the greatest destination, uh, especially my hometown, because my kids spent a lot of time in, uh, in, with my mom. My mom, you know, they say in my country that behind every successful woman, uh, there is a devoted mom. Mm. So I, I am one of these cases. I wouldn't have accomplished anything without her support. And we are very traditionalists in Romania. We care for our children and they are our babies. It's like, you know, a Latin family. You know very well from your... <laughs> yeah. It's a typical Latin family. We care about each other. We, uh, mothers sacrifice themselves. My mother, when I was pregnant with my daughter, she said, I'm too busy. She took early retirement in order to devote herself completely to our family, I was very lucky from this point of view. So, you know, the love of my family, again, gave me strength uh, to, to pursue all, all the dreams and even dreams that I never had, <laughs> you know? So uh, that's why I'm always coming back to the importance of family. And it's very important for you that you started, that you started your family. You will see, this is, this is magic. And uh, it cannot be equal to absolutely anything. For me, as a, as a woman, even if I sound traditionalist and I don't sound too modern, as <laughs> many people would like me to sound, I always tell them that my greatest achievement in life after this spectacular career for a woman, for a Romanian woman, the greatest achievement by far is being a mother. The greatest achievement and the most real and important one, not only for me and for my family, for the world. This is my contribution to the world. Two beautiful, amazing, normal children. <laughs>